And thank you to everyone for joining in. Uh, welcome to this program. Uh, if the co-host could arrange the microphones appropriately, we'd be appreciated to the muting. Uh, and thank you to everyone for joining in. We're welcome to the virtual tour, tour and learn program of the Department of Land Individual Studies and Archaeology at bar -Ilan University. Uh, we're glad to welcome you to uh, the, the third lecture in our series on uh, the history and archaeology of the land of Israel. And today we're going to be talking about the biblical period, about the site of Shiloh. I will not be able to uh, answer your questions orally during the talk, but I encourage you to ask your questions by chat, and I will address them at the end. Uh, our talk today will be deal with the biblical period and the large and thorny question of how the Israelites arrived in the land of Israel. Now, if you're up on your Bible, or even if not, you're surely aware that the question of how, who were the earliest Israelites and how they reached the land of Israel is amply addressed in the biblical narrative. We hear about the slavery in Egypt, in the books of the Torah, the 10 plagues, the Exodus, 40 years in the desert under Moses, where the Torah ends, and then the entry into the land of Israel under Joshua, where the book of Joshua and the books of the prophets begin. This is the bread and butter of the biblical narrative, and it's a well-known story which explains where the Israelites come from. However, what I'd like to address today is a different way of looking at the history, not looking at the biblical narrative, but looking at extra biblical sources, which reach us directly from the ancient world, and tell us a little bit about the history of how the Israelites reached the land of Israel. In other words, I'd like to look at the history behind the Bible. I'd like to look at other sources. And we'll be looking today at texts from the biblical period, which have been uncovered in various countries, as well as archeology span of the land of Israel. So let's begin. And I wanna begin with a brief historical background. Here are some of the archeological historical periods that we're dealing with. Uh, the period under, during which Egypt controlled the land of Israel in ancient times is called the Late Bronze Age. That's the period before, we're, before the one we're dealing with period under which the Israelites, according to the biblical story, are enslaved in Egypt, during the period during which we know that Egypt controlled the land of Israel. Then we're, and that's a period that uh, 1500 to 1200 BCE. And then we move into what archeologists call the Iron Age I. And the Iron Age I is what concerns us now. The Iron Age I is the period between 1200 and roughly 1000 before the common era. In other words, between 3200 and 1000 years ago where we find out about the early Israelites, we find out about the Philistines, those topics that uh, Professor Mayer addressed yesterday and will address again tomorrow, as well, uh, and then moving on into the Iron Age II, the period of the biblical kings, and moving through the various historical periods down to the Babylonian exile, the return to Zion, the Maccabees, and then the destruction of the Second Temple. But today we're going to be in the period indicated by the orange stars, the period between the Late Bronze and the Iron One. In other words, the period around 1200 BCE is going to be our touchstone. We're going to be looking today at the period between 1200 BCE and 1000 BCE, the period when the, we know that the Israelites first arrived and first entered the land of Israel as a large group. Now, how do we know this? As I said before, we know this from the biblical narrative and the dates here, for reasons which I'll discuss shortly, correlate the biblical narrative. The Israelites arrive around this period, but we know about the arrival of the Israelites not only from the biblical story, but also from extra biblical texts. The most famous and important of those is the first one we're going to discuss, and that is the, our first piece of information from this gentleman here, Merneftach, the Pharaoh who reigned around 1200 BCE, Pharaoh of Egypt, of course, who engages in various wars in the land of Israel. Now, why does he do this? Let's take a look at this uh, map. I assume you're somewhat familiar with the map of the land of Israel. Here you see Jerusalem, where my cursor is. You see indicated Joppa, where Tel Aviv is today. Tel Aviv and Joppa are together. Haifa up in the north. And this is the route of the ancient Egyptian conquerors which they took when conquering the land of Israel. This is a pharaoh who ruled, the root of a pharaoh who ruled 70 years before Merneftah, but all the pharaohs take more or less the same route. They enter along the northern reaches of the Sinai Peninsula, through Gaza, 
up along the main coastal road and into the valleys of northern Israel. This is the standard route that the Egyptian rulers take in conquering the land of Israel. And those conquests are done in order to be able to control the riches of the areas to the north and in order to be able to despoil the city-states that are located in the land of Israel. There are powerful local rulers, local kings of this period, who are in contact with the Egyptians. We have their correspondence with the Egyptians recorded in various texts, including most famously the El Amarna texts, but many others as well. They write to and from the Egyptians. There are powerful kings located at Megiddo in the northern valleys of Israel, at Hatzor, where my cursor is in the northern valleys, and the Egyptians come in to ensure that those local kings pay taxes to the Egyptians. The period of Mer Neftach, 1200 BCE, is a period where the Egyptians gradually become weaker. They lose control over areas to the north of the land of Israel. They are no longer in control of some of the kings in the land of Israel, some of the local rulers, and they are, decide to engage in various campaigns to the land of Israel. And here is a, ver here is a stone, a stele, which Mer Neftach wrote in 1207 BCE, detailing his various victories. It's a very fascinating fact of the ancient Egyptian kings that they never write stories of their defeats. All their, store, all their written records are about their victories. Now, we can learn from this what we wish. Obviously, they had defeats. They simply highlight their victories. And this stele of Mer Neftach was found in Egypt and is a very important source of the period we're dealing with. Much of it deals with the battles of Merneftah with Libya. He attempts to conquer Libya. That doesn't interest us right now. We're going to focus on the parts of the text that deal with Merneftah's conquests of the land of Israel. And as part of those conquests, he mentions a very fascinating detail. Here is the passage translated by my late teacher, Professor Anson Rainey, who was one of the leading experts on various languages of the ancient Near East. And he begin, it, the poem begins, as you see, with general terms, goes to specific terms, the specific terms are indicated in green, and then back to the general terms at the end. So the general terms we're going to sort of go over briefly. The great ones are prostrate, saying peace. At the end also, all who roamed have been subdued. And then not one raises his head among the nine boughs. The nine boughs are the, the, the traditional enemies of Egypt, whom every Egyptian king must defeat. And then he talks about his plundering of Libya, Khati, which is the reference to Syria and Israel, that area, the area that we live in, Khati, is at peace. And then he tells us how Canaan is plundered. So he talks about his victories in Canaan. These are the general terms, Canaan here, Haru here, Haru is a synonym for, synonym for Canaan. He speaks about his victories in Canaan and Haru. And then in the middle we have, in green, four specific areas, or four specific terms that he claims to have conquered. The first is the city of Ashkelon, and we know that Ashkelon is a city because the Egyptian determinative for city, a picture of a crown with a feather on it, appears in the stele. We know that he's speaking about Ashkelon, the city. He's conquered Ashkelon. He's seized Gezer. He's made the city of Yonoam non-existent. And finally, in the last line, before he goes on to speak about generalities, he speaks about Israel. Notice that here, in reference to Israel, he does not indicate that Israel is a city. On the contrary, he uses a determinative indicating that Israel are Semitic-speaking nomads. They are not sea dwellers, they are nomads, and the Israelites are laid waste, his seed is no more. There's a peculiar and curious fact of Jewish history that the first mention of Israel in a non-biblical text is a record of the destruction and elimination of Israel as a nation. And you will not be surprised to find out that the second mention of Israel in a non-biblical text, which appears in approximately 850 BCE, Mesha, the king of Moab, also writes, the Israel avod avad olam, and Israel has been destroyed forever. So there tend to be a lot of ancient texts that speak about Israel's being destroyed forever, which is peculiar and interesting. But what interests me here is that for Israel to have been destroyed, Israel must necessarily have been in the land of Israel, along with Ashkelon, Gezer, and Yeroam. In the year 1207 BCE, Merneftach conquers the land of Israel, captures these cities, and fights against a nation, a group of Semitic-speaking nomads called Israel. 
who claims to have destroyed them and laid waste to them and ensured that they will no longer exist. Some of this we can dismiss as, as bluster, but some of this we have to treat historically. There is a group called Israel. He didn't make it up. Now, where might that group have been located? Let's take a look here. Again, I'm looking at the four lines of the detail in the poem. We speak about Ashkelon, and you can see on the map here, again, this map of the land of Israel. Again, Jerusalem located here. Jaffa or Joppa located here near Tel Aviv. Haifa in the north. This is the Mediterranean Sea. Here is Ashkelon, where he claims to have first fought. Gezer all cities that have been excavated, known, well known from the biblical period. Ashkelon has been defeated, Gezer has been defeated, then he moves on to Yinoam in what's now Jordan. Somewhere north of Gezer, somewhere in the area of Yinoam, he encounters and fights against the people known as Israel. Where is that location? Now, sadly or otherwise, we do not know exactly where the Israel of Merneftach is located, but we have good indications. Those indications I'll discuss in a moment come to us from archeology, span but before I go into them, I wanna look at this map again. Note that he's moving from Gezer up to Yinoam, and somewhere in that region, he encounters Israel. The blue star on the map indicates the site of the city of Shechem. In Latin and Arabic and modern English, Nablus, in Hebrew and the biblical record and Egyptian texts from the ancient periods, Shechem, where the blue star is, a site that's been amply excavated. The uh, pottery from Shechem is in the University of Toronto lab laboratories and currently being published. Uh, and it's there at Shechem that we find in the biblical period, many references to Israelite settlement. And there are good reasons to connect those uh, references to Merneftach's adventure in fighting the Israelites. Why? Let's go into archaeology. I just want you to point, I want to point out again the site of Shechem and the mountains north of Shechem, this mountainous area north of Shechem, where we can locate the Israelites whom Merneftach fought. Why? Let's get into that now. The second piece of information after Merneftach, Merneftach's stele comes to us from archaeology. At the same period as Merneftach's stele, in other words, the Iron One, from the late 13th century BCE into the 12th century, all the way through the end of the 12th century BCE and into the early 11th century, we find a series of settlement sites in the mountains north of Shechem. Here's Shechem, and this map shows a very intensive archeological survey conducted by the late professor Adam Zertal in the mountains north of Shechem, walking through the mountains and identifying each site looking at the pottery and trying to date it. And the circles of the various sizes on the map show settlement sites that were begun in this period in this region. A substantial number of new settlements were begun in the area north of Shechem, exactly in the period where Merneftach writes about his defeat of the Israelites. Now, what characterizes these settlement sites? How do they relate to earlier periods? Why are they in this area and what do we know about them? Let's take a look at some of the, uh, some photos of the region and some of the characteristics of these settlements. These settlements are part of a settlement wave in the 13th, 12th centuries. Here you see the city of Shechem, the modern city of Nablus, located beneath the mountain known in Hebrew as Mount Eval, important city in the biblical period. And I showed you Mount Eval to show you that the city is, that the mountain is empty. Now that emptiness characterizes much of the region of the northern, of the mountains north of Shechem, the mountains known today as Samaria, but then known as the mountains north of Shechem, that those mountains were empty in the period before this settlement wave. In other words, we have very, very few Canaanite cities or towns of any size in these mountains. There are small farms and there are some larger towns, but very few. And those larger towns are associated and connected to the main central leadership city, which is the city of Shechem, where there is a king, and we know that about that king from the Egyptian records. Now, let's take a little bit more. So the area is largely empty, like you see in the picture. A bunch of new settlements are established, indicated by the circles here. What do we know about these settlements? Let's move on. This is a map of settlements 
a little bit farther north of Shechem in an area close to the, the town of Dotan. And as you can see here in the topographic map, the settlements are located around the edges of valleys. They're located in, ed in the edges of valleys. They coexist with the Canaanite settlements, but they are all the new settlements are tiny settlements not located to any royal city, not connected to any royal cities, not connected to any city states. They are entirely disconnected from the Canaanite system of settlements, which center around the royal city in the city of Shechem. Again, in Shechem, there was a royal city, a central city. The Canaanite towns are connected to Shechem. The new towns established in the settlement wave are disconnected from Shechem. They don't, they aren't part of a settlement pattern where you have large towns, small towns, and a central city. On the contrary, all the new settlement towns are, all the new settlements are tiny hamlets, tiny locations located on the edges of valleys, and in some cases, in the mountainous areas. So in one respect, they are, they, in several respects, they differ from the Canaanite settlements. They are not part of a range with towns, cities, and hamlets. We find only hamlets. A second point is that they are in the, on the edges of the valleys and not in the valleys, unlike the Canaanite settlements. And a third point is that they seem to have their own places of worship. They do not seem to use this Canaanite places of worship, uh, which are located perforce in the royal cities. On the contrary, here is a very interesting site located on Mount Eval, dug by Adam Zertal. Uh, it is known as the altar on Mount Eval, and much ink has been spilled on its, uh, on its nature. Uh, it appears from the archaeological, I'm summarizing a very long debate here, but it appears from the archaeological record that this is indeed an altar established around the period we're dealing with, right in the Iron One, an altar full of bones of sheep, goats, oxen, and deer. Which, was, which served as a sort of central cultic site, a central worship site for the inhabitants of these new settlements. They didn't use the altars located in the royal cities, but rather established their own altars on the mountaintops. And other cult, another important and inter very, very interesting and enigmatic cultic site is located where the red dot is located on this map. This red dot is right along the Jordan Valley. You can see on the map the Jordan River taking its way along the dividing line between the West Bank and Jordan, the Jordan River here. The red dot is a site along very close to the Jordan Valley, and it is a cultic site from this period known in Arabic as Beit al-Shaab, very, very interesting site, also indicative of a new type of uh, settlement, people disconnecting themselves from the Canaanite culture. Now, we're going to move into a third piece of information. So we've talked about Merneftah speaking about the Israelites. We've talked about uh, the disconnect between the settlement wave of the, the period of Merneftah and Canaanite culture, new settlements disconnected from Canaanite culture. And we're going to illustrate that at the site that I used to title this lecture, the site of Shiloh. Shiloh is a very important site in the biblical period. It's the site of central site where the Israelites According to the biblical narrative in Samuel, at the end of Kings, also, at the end of Judges, also Judges and Samuel, the Israelites established there the tabernacle, the Mishkan at Shiloh. It's located in the mountains just south of Shechem. Here, Shechem, the red dot indicates Shiloh. Here we have the Jordan Valley that we spoke about. Of course, here is Tel Aviv, and here is Jerusalem. Here in the mountains is Shiloh, and here is a somewhat fanciful recreation by an artist of what the tabernacle might have looked like against the background of modern Shiloh. Note that it is an artistic rendition, hence you have the tabernacle coexisting with cars. Uh, and uh, it's a nice artistic rendition. Uh, it's not historical, but it gives you a sense of the mountainous region in which Shiloh is located. And here is a picture of, again, the site of Shiloh with the red dot, a picture without that uh, recreation of the tabernacle of the archeological site of Shiloh which is in the middle of the West Bank and which is actively being dug. And we'll move on now to talk a little bit about what we find at Shiloh. Now, all around the city of Shiloh, around the ancient city of Shiloh, is a very well-built wall, which was built long before the Iron One. It dates to the Middle Bronze Age, approximately 
1600 BCE, in other words, around uh, 400 years before the first of the Israelites would have reached uh, the land of Israel, before, 400 years before Joshua, 400 years before Merneftah's mention of the Israelites. And it's actually law that we find, we find this wall surrounding the site, and we find the late 12th century or, or so, is new, these new settlers beginning to settle in Shiloh. Now, where do you think they might settle? The logical thing for them to do would be to use this wall, which exists to this day and therefore existed in their period, as fortification and to settle inside the city. That's the logical thing to do. You settle inside the city. This is this gentleman in the orange shirt is outside the city. You settle on the other side of the wall inside the city. You build, you use the wall as fortification. You defend yourself against your enemies. You have a ready built wall to your service. But that's not what the Israelites who settle in Shiloh in the late 12th century do. On the contrary, they settle outside the wall. And here's a very interesting phenomenon, a picture of the initial archeological excavations uh, conducted by Israel Finkelstein uh, about uh, 35 years ago, outside the walls of Shiloh, where we find a very, very interesting building. Now the building of course has suffered some damage in the last 3,200 years, uh, but you can still see the walls of the building indicated by these stones. This back wall is the wall of the city, which they use as the back wall of the house. They settle outside their city. They're not settling inside. They're settling outside the city. Here you see storage jars found complete in sight uh, against the walls of this house, where the back wall of the house is against the wall of the city. And look here at this plan, which is part of Finkelstein's publication in the journal Tel Aviv from 1985. You see here this house that we just saw, this is a schematic rendition of that same house. The entry into the house is here up these stairs. There's a pillared courtyard, courtyard area, which is the central room of the house. There are side rooms to the house, all of which could act, can be accessed from the central courtyard. And the back wall of the house is up against the wall of the site, which we saw before. And here you see the four storage jars that were found in site and another one of these houses next to it. Uh, those houses have been preserved. You can visit them if you go to Shiloh, if you care to. And you can see how these uh, sites, are, how these settlements are located outside. Now, this is part of the same settlement wave that I discussed earlier. The settlement wave, which is contemporaneous with the, uh, which begins contemporaneously with uh, Merneftah's mention of the Israelites. And it's a settlement wave, which, as part of which, people settle at Shiloh outside the wall and thus show their disconnect from the remains of the culture that are inside the wall, they do not want to be part of the Canaanite culture. They disconnect from Canaanite city-state um, political culture, as we saw earlier in establishing hamlets rather than cities. They disconnect from, disconnect from Canaanite religious culture by establishing their own worship sites. They disconnect connect even from Canaanite military culture by placing themselves outside the city walls. It's a very interesting phenomenon, settlement outside the city walls at Shiloh. This is about 100 years later than the earliest settlements, but it's part of the same phenomenon. Now, there are many other ways in which these people distinguish themselves from Canaanite culture. Of course, the most, the most famous and perhaps the most significant is their refusal to use Canaanite imported pottery or Canaanite decorated pottery. Now, they may have been too, too, too poor to afford those items, but they continue to eschew Canaanite decorated pottery and Canaanite imported pottery for a very long period, and they develop their own unique culture. They do not want to be part of the Canaanite uh, the culture. They distance themselves from the Canaanite monarch, uh, monarchic centers from the royal cities and from sites connected to such centers. We're going to move now on to our fourth piece of information, a site located abutting very close to Tel Aviv. Here is Tel Aviv on the map. The red dot indicates the Canaanite city of Afek, which was excavated by uh, Moshe Kohavi from Tel Aviv University in the, in the 80s. Uh, it's a very, very interesting site today, a national park with several pools of water, a very nice green lung for the larger Tel Aviv area. And we'll also be discussing the, blue star, the location at the Blue Star on this map, that blue star located just a couple of miles inland 
from the red dot is the site of Izbet Sarta, a settlement from the Iron One, which we'll be discussing in a few minutes. So again, the two sites on this map, the red dot is Afek, the Canaanite city, and the blue star is the settlement in Izbet Sarta, which we'll be discussing in a few minutes. And all in all, we're about 15 kilometers inland from Tel Aviv. A short bus ride from Tel Aviv will take you to Tel Afek. And here in the map, here in the picture, you see the remains of the remains at Tel Afek, the remains of one of the buildings at Tel Afek, the building that interests us. It's a building which was rebuilt many times, but its foundations contain a city from a, a residence from the Canaanite period. And the residence is fairly, fairly well uh, documented and fairly well um, excavated. Here you see an aerial view of this residence. And as you can see, it's a rather more complex residence than the residence we saw at Shiloh. To get into the central room, and this is the central room of this residence, you have to go into an inner courtyard, past this first courtyard, go around here to get to the central room. There is, unlike the Israelite site, the, unlike the, the building at Shiloh, where you have a central courtyard from which access can be gained to all the side rooms, at Afek, the Canaanite city, we have a different type of residence, an Egyptian governor's residence, which is associated with the Canaanite elite, where they would have a central, and we have several of these located in the Gaza region, in, in the northern valleys, uh, and here at Afek. And the central room was very difficult to access, obviously, in order to protect the governor. Now, this location, this uh, governor's residence, which is dated archaeologically to the 12th, uh, 13th, late 13th and 12th century, is uh, very rich in inscriptions. Many, many texts were found at this residence. And I'm going to show you a map prepared for us um, by the excavators of this site, uh, by Tamar Zinger, who's one of the experts in the texts found at the site at Tamar Zinger of Tel Aviv University. And he shows us here how around this building, the same building I just showed you, but here in, a, in a isometric reconstruction, we find here five fragments of cuneiform writing. Cuneiform writing was the writing developed in Mesopotamia, used for the Akkadian language. It's the language of the international correspondence in this period. It's a language which the kings of Egypt corresponded with the kings of Babylon, corresponded with the kings of Assyria, and corresponded also with the kings of Canaan. It is the official language for international correspondence. It's a very difficult language. Think Latin in the, medi in the medieval period. Uh, and it, in this site are found no less than five fragments of cuneiform writing, a further fragment outside the site, further letters from Ugarit, an important city in the north, uh, a whole series of letters indicate, attesting to and indicating that this site is part of an international system of kings who correspond and write in international languages and employ scribes to write for them in Akkadian. Akkadian involves the learning of over 2,000 different symbols. It cannot be mastered in less than three years of intensive writing and learning. Uh, one has to employ a professional scribe to write in Akkadian. Those scribes would be trained in schools, probably in northern Syria or Turkey. Uh, and would come from there as paid employees to the land of Israel. Uh, it is not a simple system to master. And in order to write an Akkadian, you have to be part of a royal culture where there is a king who has extra money to pay scribes to write in Akkadian. And this is what we have at Afek, this Canaanite city located at the red dot over here along only a few miles from Tel Aviv. When we look west from Afek, we look, uh, sorry, excuse me, when we look east from Afek, look west from Afek, we see the, the sea. But now we're gonna look east from Afek and we get into the mountains. Here is Shechem, which we talked about earlier. Here is Shiloh, which we talked about earlier. The, the rivulet or the wadi, the Nachal that runs near Shiloh comes out right not far, very not far from Afek. And here at the edge of the mountains, we have this site indicated by the blue star, star the site known in Arabic as Izbet Tsarta, the cattle land of the village of Tsarta, a village that existed in this region. Let's take a look at the site of Izbet Tsarta. And as you can see, I'm there in the middle of the picture. 
as you can see, there are no impressive buildings in Isbet Sarta. We have pits dug into the, into the limestone. We have small remains of buildings, and we're looking towards the mountainous areas. We're at the edge of the mountains. We're at the point where the mountains meet the coast. Here is Isbet Sarta in the mountains, the blue star. And effect, the red dot is already in the coastal region. The hatching indicates that you're already in the mountains. The flat, empty area indicates you're in the coastal area. From Isbet Sarta to Afek, we're crossing the divide from the mountains to the coastal region. Isbet Sarta is indicated is in the mountains, and the types of buildings and types of remains we have there are very, very different. We have an enormous number of pits, enormous number of pits lined with stones used in order to uh, store grain in this period. And in fact, the first layers, the first settlement layers of Isbet Sarta have more pits than houses. People were very, in, were very focused on having areas to store their grain. Their houses were very rudimentary. They are not the kind of glorious many room houses we have at Afek. On the contrary, this is a reconstruction of the house's remains. And as you can see, it's a house, it's the, it's the largest house at the site. It's with a central room and side rooms. Uh, but it's very, very rudimentary. It's not a very uh, well-built house. It's the same style of house with a central courtyard and side rooms that we saw at Shiloh. It's the type of house that represents the exclusive type of house in the mountains of this period. All the settlements of the new settlements of the 13th, 12th centuries, late 13th and 12th centuries in the highlands, in the mountains, have this type of house called a four-room house. Let's look back at the map from, is from Shiloh, the four-room house at Shiloh. Again, you have an entrance, you have a central courtyard, you have a side room which is access from a central courtyard, you have another side room which is also access from a central courtyard. All the rooms can be accessed from the central courtyard. That's what defines a four-room house. It might have two side rooms, it might have three side rooms, uh, a few days ago, my students and I took a field trip to the hills in Samaria, and we saw a house, for, uh, what's called a four-room house, but it has five side rooms. I know it's a very large four-room house. What characterizes a four-room house is not the number of rooms, but the existence of a central courtyard with rooms surrounding it. All the rooms can be accessed from the central courtyard. It's a very interesting type of house, and it is the exclusive house used in the highlands uh, the mountains in the late 13th, 12th centuries in this settlement wave that we're describing. This settlement wave, in my estimation, can be associated with the Israelites that Mernetach spoke about. The Israelites who settled in the mountains used the four-room house as their exclusive type of dwelling. I mentioned earlier that they eschew Canaanite pottery, decorated, and they imported. We spoke about how they cut contact with Canaanite city-states where there are royal cities. They don't use Canaanite worship sites. Uh, they develop their own ritual and cultic centers. And let's look a little bit more at one very interesting, one further point in which they differ from the Canaanites. At this site of Isbet Sarta, which I described, right here's the site of Isbet Sarta, this very small site in the hills, of, at the edge of the hills where the blue star is, today in the town of Rosh Ha'ayin, and you can go there. The JNF has sponsored a little park there, and you can go and visit the site in the mountains of Isbet Sarta, and you can see the industrial park, the factories of Rosh Ha'ayin in the background. At the site of Isbet Sarta, in one of those pits, remember those pits that I described? In one of those pits was found a little piece of clay, and inscribed in that piece of clay were several lines of ancient Hebrew letters. Now, you, these letters are the same letters that the Canaanites used, but there's a very interesting and unusual feature to these letters. These letters are incised on a little piece of pottery, and these are the letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Written from left to right, you have first Aleph, and then Bet, and then Gimel, and then Daled, and then a He with a mistake. The He should only have three, two lines. It should look something like an F. Instead, it has three lines, and furthermore, it's written in mirror. The person who wrote this was a very inexpert scribe, someone who was learning to write and wrote using mirror writing, typical of children. In other words, the type of writing here is completely different from the type of writing we find at a fake. 
Now, a fake is only a few miles away, a fake where there's the Canaanite uh, city and the governor's residency, that red dot, and the many uh, inscriptions in cuneiform indicating a royal uh, influence. Here, on the contrary, in Izbet Sarta, up in the hills, a few miles away, Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalet, Hey, written backwards, a very, very poor Vav, Chet, written before Zion, the person doesn't know the order of letters in the alphabet, and then Tet, and so on. The letters are written, the letters are written in a very uh, unusual and uh, inexpert hand, indicating that a poor resident, perhaps a child, is learning here to write. And Isbet Sarta, in the high, in the, in the, high, in the at the edge of the highlands, the edge of the mountains, where the Israelite culture is predominant, children are learning to write. A child, at least, is learning to write. In contrast, at Afek, the red dot, down on the coast, where the Canaanites are, writing is done by expert scribes in cuneiform. Now, it's very interesting. In no Canaanite site have we found an abecedary, an Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalad written. We have two Israelite sites, this and another site, which is near Tel Zayit, which is identified by the excavator as uh, an Israelite site, where we find Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalad written. No Canaanite site, you have Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalad. You have letters of the alphabet here and there, writing things like dedicating this, uh, this, uh, this arrow to this god, or dedications to other gods, but here we have the letters Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalad, indicating a new type of culture, a culture in which there is a disconnect from royal uh, trappings, a disconnect from city-states, a disconnect from royalty, and a disconnect from the international system, and an attempt to develop an independent culture in the highlands. Aleph, Bet, Gimel, Dalad, writing some of the letters wrong, writing some of the letters backward, but disconnecting from the Egyptians, disconnecting from royalty, disconnecting from imports, developing their own culture, and emphatically not being Canaanites. So let's look here at our conclusion. What do we know about the early Israelites? Merneftach tells us that the Israelites existed as a definable group by 1200 BCE, somewhere in the northern half of Israel. From archaeology, we know that there are settlements in the area north of Shechem, and they are disconnected from the city-state system. For this reason, I think that they are part of the same uh, group that Merneftah calls the Israelites. At Shiloh, we find that the new settlers live outside the wall, which remains from the earlier periods. And in Izbet Sarta, we find that the new settlers distinguish themselves and are in conflict with the Canaanite Philistine center at Afek. Izbet Sarta, again, was that blue star, whereas Afek was the red dot. They develop a different culture, including literacy, but not literacy, as the Canaanites had it, where the king and his employees write, but rather literacy where children at very poor sites, where they don't have money to big build, build big buildings, children in small sites learn to write. Thank you for your attention. I'd like to ask you at this point to share some questions with me on chat. While you're asking your questions, I'll tell you a little bit about Bar Ilan's um, Department of Land of Israel Studies and Archaeology. We are the Martin Zuss Department of Land of Israel Studies and Archaeology. We have, of course, a full range of programs in Hebrew as well as MA and PhD programs in English. And here are a, list, a partial list of our faculty who specialize in the ancient periods. We also, of course, have faculty who specialize in modern Israel. Uh, and we have, we study all periods of the land of Israel, uh, including through archaeology, historical geography, which is my area of interest, nature, uh, demography, and so on. Uh, we have a unique social and open learning atmosphere. Uh, multidisciplinary in terms of integrating history with biology, with botany, with sociology, archaeology, and other areas. We study the land of Israel from all periods. Uh, and here are some of the courses that are being offered in English in our new English program, which we hope to start in the near future. I appreciate you, uh, your interest, and I'd be very grateful uh, to hear your questions now, if Erez would be so kind as to ask them, please. Okay, there were two questions about uh, Shiloh. One, yes. uh, uh, where the Israelites uh, did not live inside the wall from the previous period. And the other question about Shiloh, uh, was there a time that Israelites and Canaanites live in the same time in Shiloh? No. Okay, good. Let's, let's go back to uh, the Shiloh slides. 
uh, I simplified the area. One can give a several hour lecture on Shiloh and I really simplified. Uh, but first of all, as I indicated briefly, the wall here is a middle bronze wall. In the period before Iron One, which is of course late bronze, the site is empty or, or is virtually empty. The, 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 wall, the wall does not date from the, art, from the uh, late bronze. The wall dates from the middle bronze. It seems to be empty in the, as far as we know, it seems to be empty in the late bronze. And in the Iron One, a, there is a substantial settlement, which I would associate with the Israelites from the late 12th century, outside the wall, using that middle bronze wall that's substantially earlier. Now there is some, there is also some settlement in the Iron One inside the wall, but that's not unexpected. What's unexpected is that they settle outside the wall. That's the very interesting part. Uh, the settlement inside the wall exists, is known, uh, is somewhat more limited and has been excavated more recently, so I'm not talking about it, uh, but that's, that's expected. We're looking for the, the, the unexpected. And the unexpected here is the settlement outside the wall. Okay, um, please, uh, okay. further questions. Yeah, okay. Um, another two questions. What was the size of the um, population? Uh, how many people lived in each uh, site you were talking about? Um, and the uh, other question, is it possible that the Israelites were already in the land of Israel maybe a hundred years before Mar Tah? It is certainly possible that the Israelites were in the land of Israel hundred years, two hundred years before Mar Tah. We simply have no evidence for that. Um, that's a very interesting question. The settlement, the settlement wave that I described begins, was dated, according to Adam Zeratel, in the middle of the 13th century. In other words, it begins about 40 years before Menachtach, roughly 40 years. Now, one can say 40, 50, 30, we don't know. But the settlement wave begins about 40 years before Menachtach. And for that reason, the settlement wave does predate Menachtach. Now, the question, of course, how long are the Israelites in the land of Israel for? Did they come in just before Merneftach? Did they come in long before Merneftach? We only know what we have from archaeology. And of course, we have the biblical, biblical record. The biblical record is interesting. In the book of Joshua, it sounds like all the Israelites enter as one under Joshua. The book of Judges, we have in the first chapter of Judges, we have, story, we have a narrative about how different tribes settle in different areas, in different ways. That seems less organized by a central figure. And in the book of Chronicles, at the very end of the Bible, we have a story about how at the time when the Israelites are in Egypt, when Joseph and his sons are in Egypt, some of those sons are visiting and being present in the land of Israel. Ephraim, Joseph's son, is in the land of Israel and is living there and is making great efforts to settle the land of Israel. So according to Chronicles, the Israelites were there all the way through. It's interesting. It's fascinating. If I have, if you force me to reconstruct, I would say something along the following lines. There are small groups who, who, of Israelites, or people who consider themselves Israelites, before Merneftach, but it's at the middle of the 13th century, about 40 years before Merneftach, that we find the big wave coming in. Big wave of Israelites, primarily into the mountains north of Shechem. Uh, you also asked about how many people live in these sites. That's a very important and interesting question. Let me take a look at a site like Shiloh, a site like Shiloh. Uh, is, I would guesstimate, somewhere in the area of several dunam. The st uh, I, would, I would guesstimate in the area of 20 dunam. I don't have the exact figure. If anyone has it, please share it on uh, the chat. Uh, but what we, the relevant point is that for every dunam, dunam is, by the way, 1,000 square meters. For every 1,000 square meters of built-up city or built-up buildings, we approximate that there are about 40 people living. So it is Betzarita, which is a much, much smaller site. It's Betzarita, this little site over here, here in the mountains, where you can barely see about 2,000 square meters of built-up area. Uh, we wouldn't have more than 80 people at maximum. Right, this is a small site, 80 people. We go to a site like a fake, which is much, much larger. We could reach perhaps 1,000 people or even more. Uh, and you get to a site like Shiloh, we have several hundred people. The general rule is you take every thousand meters, for every thousand meters of built-up area, you multiply it, multiply it by 40. So that's your, your general rule. 
you can reach cities in this period of several thousand inhabitants. I mean, Megiddo is, an, is a very, very large city. Uh, so to Afek, so to Tel Safi, which Professor Mayer will discuss tomorrow, these are all very large sites. And they have many, many more people. But the Israelite sites are all very small and have most of them, when I say hamlets, less than 100 people in them. Any further questions, further comments people would like to share? Okay. Um... Um, someone, uh, uh, someone asked, um, what makes those four settlements that you talk about Israelite? That's a very important and interesting and controversial question. So thank you for asking. Yeah, uh, we cannot prove that these settlements are Israelite. There is no text in these settlements that says, here lived Israelites. What can we do? We can compare the archaeological record in these sites with the archaeological record we find at sites uh, which we know are Canaanites. We find very different, very important differences from the Canaanite sites. Furthermore, we know that the areas in the hill country, the areas, uh, let me just look at the map again, the areas uh, between Shiloh, the areas north, Shiloh, Shechem, that area is the heartland of Israelite settlement according to the biblical narrative. And when we get down into the Iron Two, there is no dispute that this area is settled mm -hmm. by Israelites. So essentially what I'm doing is I'm retrojecting from Iron Two to Iron One and saying, mm -hmm. well, if in Iron Two we have the same material culture and they're Israelites, then perhaps in Iron One, these are also Israelites. Furthermore, the peculiarities that we find in Iron Two, where they issue the, um, the Canaanite illustrate the Canaanite decorated pottery, and they issue the Canaanite imported pottery, and they issue the uh, Canaanite uh, political system. All those exist also in Iron One, uh, and this is a topic of a very interesting and thought-provoking book by Professor Avram Faust, formerly of our department, called Israel's Ethnogenesis, and it's a very involved and detailed book. But I encourage you to to look at parts of it. Uh, it's a very interesting presentation where he makes the argument, I think a convincing one, uh, for identifying these settlements as Israelites. Now, regardless, even if you reject Professor Faust's arguments, and the arguments of many other, many other scholars, uh, you are still forced to identify somewhere in the land of Israel, somewhere in 1209 BCE, there is a group called Israel. We cannot debate that, because Merneftach tells us that they're there, that he fought against them, and that they were destroyed. And so we are no longer able to argue that there are no Israelites. You will see various charlatans on the web claiming that this is not Israel, but rather the name of a city, uh, rather the name of some other group. It's for that reason that I emphasize the Egyptian determinative. The Israelites are a clearly defined group uh, in this period, a Semitic speaking group of nomads somewhere in the northern part of the country. Uh, no mikvaot are known from this period. Mikvaot are a second temple phenomenon. For more on ritual purity in, uh, the, in, the, in, the, in the Iron Age, uh, see a very interesting article by Abraham Faust on uh, Tel Iton, E-T-O-N, and uh, some evidence of uses of, purity, of purification vessels there. Um, uh, right, Sean? well, the very interesting question which Mordechai asked is at what point does archaeology begin uh, engaging with uh, the biblical narrative. Well, it's a very interesting point, and I argue here that this presentation of the Israelites in the hill country corresponds closely with the description in uh, for, in the first chapter of the Book of Judges. In the Book of Jud in the Book of Judges, we find uh, in the first chapter that the Israelites are. Uh, settling throughout the hill country, but are not settling in the lowlands. And that seems to be a, an interesting connection uh, to these sites. Uh, I'm going to respond now with the last question to Ido Winter's question. Ido Winter asked, uh, what connects the four sites? How do we know the same people lived in Izbetzaita and Shiloh and in those settlements north of Shechem? Uh, what connects the sites is the distinctive pottery, not the pottery itself, but the pottery assemblage, the michlol. The, the types of pottery we find in the sites are the same pottery we find in the Canaanite sites. But in the Canaanite sites, we also find decorated pottery, 
we also find imported pottery. In these sites, no decorated, no imported. That's one point. Second point, four room houses. In these sites, we find four room houses. In Canaanite sites, we also find four room houses. But in these sites, we find only four room houses to the exclusion of all else. In the Canaanite sites, we find four room houses as well as other types of houses. So there are a series of markers, and I'm, I'm, I'm abbreviating here, a series of markers, two of which are types of pottery and types of houses, which when looked at in the larger uh, context, indicate that the culture here in these highland settlements is similar. Okay, last question I can't avoid, okay. Uh, if, the, if, if they lived outside the walls of Shiloh, why would the King Clare care about claiming victory? It would not be a, similar, a significant victory. The Israelites probably have light defenses. That's true at Shiloh. And it raises the question of where uh, Mernaftach fought the Israelites. We don't really know where Mernaftach fought the Israelites. As you see in this map, uh, the reconstruction of Mernaftach's route puts Mernaftach running through the valleys. Mernaftach doesn't go into the hill country. Uh, there are almost no Egyptian kings of the, uh, there are no Egyptian kings of this period who go into the hill country. The only Egyptian king who does that is later Shishak. Uh, why did the Egyptian kings, uh, why do they fight with the Israelites? Probably because the Israelites came down from the hills and at some point were in the, uh, the edges of the valleys and in some way interacted with Shishak and Shishak felt the need to fight them. We don't really know why and where Shishak fought them. Oh, sorry, we don't know why and where Merneftach fought them. Shishak, we know Shishak is much later. We're talking here about Merneftach. Merneftach fought the Israelites probably at the edges of the valleys when the Israelites came down from the hills. Dear yeah, Sean, may I formulate also a comment? Yes. Uh, could you uh, show again uh, as a slide of the Israel Stella of Merneptah? Yes. Please. Yes. Uh, you, you had a translation. Exactly. Yes. 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 Now, uh, I wanted to point uh, to the fact that uh, the stretch between Giza and Yenuam is actually uh, the stretch south-north of the uh, upper Ritenu. Yes. Describing actually not to punctually to cities which were attacked by Merneptah, which we, because we know the destructions during this war of Merneptah were uh, far bigger, involving also Hathor probably, and uh, it's actually a threat describing uh, as a region, entire region of Retenu, Upper Retenu, while Ashkelon is corresponding to Canaan or Karu. Because I want to draw your attention to the fact that uh, Maneta left more uh, stella as only this Israel stella. Uh, most uh, of them are in Nubia. Yes. Uh, these are the Amada, the Amara West, uh, Wadi Eshebwa, uh, and Aksha. These uh, stele are using a complete, a complete different terminology than the Israel stele. Israel is lacking, but is replaced by Ritenu. Karu is present, Jeze is present, and uh, so on. <laughs> That's very interesting. Thank you very much. We have the privilege of hearing here from Dr. Mich uh, Michael Banyai, one of the leading Egyptologists whose work I've enjoyed uh, reading and who's written for some very important material about the Assyrian period. And I look forward, if you'd be so kind as to send us your articles on uh, this uh, much earlier period. And uh, we, we, I look forward to reading that and finding out more about the other stele of Merneftah, which, uh, which Professor Banyai is aware of. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, we'll, we don't have time for a further question, but I would look forward to, to discussing further with Professor Banyai. Uh, okay, yes, we'll take one more question no, from the popular Sean audience. Just, Sean, just uh, one last question yeah, uh, well, that was asked before. Why was Shiloh was chosen to be the capital? Well, it's a very interesting question. We don't entirely know the, region, the reason. Uh, there, 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 we, don't, we don't have a really good reason. Uh, someone asked about the Agaman enclosure, and I'll just give a one very, very brief comment about the Agaman enclosure along the, uh, sorry, along the Jordan River. Uh, and right, the Agaman enclosure is right here, the red dot along the Jordan River. Uh, it, uh, Adam Zartel talked about it being in a, the shape of a, of a foot, footprint. 
uh, suggested that it's a cultic site. It's a very interesting and enigmatic site about which more remains to be discovered. Thank you to everyone for sharing with, uh, for sharing your, uh, sharing your thoughts and your questions with us. I look forward to speaking with, speaking with each of you individually. I look forward to continuing the conversation with Professor Banyai. And uh, I remind you that this series is continuing uh, tomorrow with a lecture by Professor Aaron Mayer on uh, the excavations at Tel Asafi, the, the important Philistine site. Uh, the next day we're going to be hearing about Jerusalem and on Sun uh, from Dr. Amit Dagan. And on Sunday, I'll be lecturing about Lachish and the Assyrians uh, and how they interact. Thank you very much to all of you. Have a very good and safe day. Thank you.